And, but the plan was to get up to Harrisonburg, form up, and then battle with the Yankees and have the big one. Well, we got detected at Gettysburg. We wasn't all formed up. We didn't have our whole team up there, but we had to fight. The very first day, we did very, very well. The second day, more Union troops dug in. General George Gordon Meade was given control of the whole Union Army at that time, right? A few days before that. Uh, up till then, you had quite a bit of trouble with McClellan and Tucker. Uh, we'll talk about that in a little yeah, bit. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, um, long story short, everything went pretty well on the second day except for the Battle of Little, Little Round Top, which they had much, much higher ground. And then on the third day, you may have heard the Battle of Pickett's Charge. This was a area about a mile across. The Union line was about three and a half miles long It made a fish hook. At any point in time, the Union line, if they were being attacked here in the middle of the fish hook, they could take troops from the end of the fish hook, bring them around to bolster the center of that line or wherever that line was being attacked. And they had a little bit higher ground, okay? And the Union troops were shooting from behind <coughs> stacked boulders or rocks about this high. Now, as we had to go, General Lee, come up with a plan. And it was a good plan. The plan was, we're going to cannonade the center of this line for two hours two and a half hours. We're going to bust that up. We're going to soften that up. General Jeb Stewart's 4,500 men, cavalry, is going to go around and attack them from the rear, in the center of that line. General Ewell's Corps is going to attack from basically the town of Gettysburg. And so it's a three-pronged attack. But this field, this mile-long field, that our troops had to cross, we had to cross the Emmitsburg Road and two layers of split rail fence that was this high. That meant the men that, meant the men that were climbing that fence were setting ducks. For cannons, shooting canister or shotgun, shot, which is, and also uh, grape shot, which is the nails, glass, anything they could put in that barrel to shoot. They didn't just shoot cannonballs. Well, General Lee had this plan, and in General Lee's defense, okay, first of all, I told him there's no army of 15,000 men ever formed that can take this position under these conditions. I want to back off, choose higher ground, get them out of their entrenchments, let them attack us on the higher ground like we did at Fredericksburg, which we wiped them out at Frederick, Fredericksburg, Virginia. But he thought this way, in his defense. We've come up here, we've gotten up here with close to 60,000 men. All these troops and wagon trains, supplies, and you're talking about blacksmiths and everything. We went, you know, we've got to make a move. We've got to have a victory. And with divine intervention, and with Jeb Stewart coming around the back, and when General Ewell attacked him, it'll work. I said, suicide. Suicide. But, you know, I had my viewpoints. I was a lifelong soldier. He was a lifelong soldier. He had his viewpoints. I just explained what I think his viewpoints was. His neck was on the line back to Richmond. My neck was on the line for all these men that was going to get wiped out, like Hamburg. And as it turned out, the cannonade that shot for two and a half hours, the fuses were ill-timed, and the cannons went harmlessly, the shot went harmlessly over the center of that Union line and exploded in the rear harmlessly. General Longstreet, may I add something on that about the cannonade? What had happened was uh, Porter Alexander, you know, he is from Augusta, Georgia, and some of the best Black powder in the world came from that area. 
Well, all that powder had come, and it was so strong that they used for what he uh, thought was the regular side. It shot over due to some of the black powder and some of the things that he had mentioned, but the powder was one of the issues on the, that terrible cannonade for two and a half hours. It harmlessly went over because the powder was so strong. And this actually came from uh, uh, when I did the Augusta bin. I was amazed that that part was never shown in a book. And another thing you gotta understand, once those first one, two, three cannons take off, start shooting, he mentioned black powder, you can't see nothing. You can't see whether you're hitting your target or not hitting your target. But we found out later, we were not hitting our target. The shot was going way over the line and harmlessly landed in the background. Now, the plan of Jeb Stewart's roughly 4,500 cavalry men going around the right-hand side and attacking from the rear didn't work out too well either. Jeb Stewart's horses were needed shod. Their hooves of the horses were shot. The men had been asleep in the saddle for basically two weeks on the way to Gettysburg. I'm gonna let him tell you about what happened on his charge around the rear of the line. July 4th, July 3rd, 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 3rd. Third. yes sir. Gerald Lee asked me to be a vital part of that plan that happened on July 3rd, 1863. While Pickett's men were charging the front, I would lead my cavalry, which had been horribly demoralized and ran to death for a couple hundred miles. I was to attack the rear. I was in a tree line. And I could see the blue troops out in front of me. And there's a man with long golden locks and that was leading some men across from my position. Y'all may know him as George Armstrong Custer. Our two forces clashed. His men had Spencer, well, had Sharps carbines. My men's weapons were rusted, old. Ammunition was hard to come by. Horses were basically useless, especially with the with any kind of dismounted cavalry troops that they had out, us outnumbered. It was a miserable situation, and I was forced to pull back, meaning that. Pickett's charge that hit him in the front hit him without any threat to the rear of the enemy lines. So I had to pull my cavalry back. There's nothing else I could have done. Everything that could go wrong on that third day did go wrong. And we had no choice but to retreat back to Virginia in downpouring rain. The next day was the 4th of July. Now, what happened on the 4th of July? General Grant, I'll let you take that over. Vicksburg, Mississippi. I'll take it. All right, I'm All right. All right um, we go back to the beginning of the thing of the war. Um, the first loss for the South was when I got elected. Now, if you look back and see in past history, the Democrats and the Southern people had control of Washington City. All through the years, there's been not a Whig or Republican in that office. They had control of everything. But when I won the election, they decided to pack up their bags and go home. Well, they didn't. They didn't like what some of my thoughts that, that I had said, or they thought I was going to do certain things. But the war goes on, starts, and I got to figure out what I'm going to do. So the first thing I got to do is get my cabinet. And the second thing we got to do is we got to supply for something. You know, everything started to break loose, and I just got elected. So now I got to find some general to run the army. First choice, Winfield Scott said, Robert E. Lee. Well, he refused my offer because Virginia had succeeded when I got inaugurated. So now I go with McDowell, and the first Manassas was a disaster, as we quoted earlier. The South was better prepared than I was. I only had 16,400 troops total in the Army at this point. So now i got to figure out what I can do. So I need to call up some troops. Now, 
Militia Act of 1792 allows me to bring up some troops. I caught up to 85,000. So now I've got over 90,000 troops. I'm not sure how many they had. But we got troops, but I got McDowell who's going to do lead the army. He's after it, Manassas. Uh, Beauregard was ready and prepared. Joe Johnston come in and help him. So we backed off. So now we go to McClellan. Now McClellan is a West Point graduate, uh, one of the top in his class, I uh, understand. And he was a great organizer, but he was always um, complaining about not having enough men. He always complained that Robert E. Lee had twice as many as he had. In true, he had twice as many as Robert E. Lee had. So he had over 100,000, and Robert E. Lee only had about 60,000 at that point. So we, we changed him out. We had uh, Winfield Scott, who was the general in chief, and him and uh, uh, McClellan didn't get along. So finally, he kind of forced uh, Winfield Scott out. And we put uh, McClellan in charge. Now, Halleck was in the West, over in the Western Theater. And Grant was under Halleck. Um, and of course, Halleck was not, um, didn't treat Grant very well. He, he didn't uh, respect him, I guess, because of his ability. But anyway, uh, McClellan was, was here in charge, and he was still trying to run the army, doing a poor job. So we relieved him of command there for a while, and myself and uh, Stanton took over, the Secretary of War. We took over, we didn't do a much better job either. So we brought in Polk, and Polk didn't do nothing better either. So we brought McClellan back to put him in charge in the East. Now, all this time, everybody over here is fighting a separate battle than these guys over here. We brought Halleck over and put him in charge, the general in chief. He left Grant in the Western Theater. Now, see, he'd done Fort Donaldson, Fort Henry, and he was at Big, they had a little trouble at Shiloh, but then he got to Vicksburg. 48 day siege of Pemberton at, at uh, Vicksburg. Now, you understand the Ohio, uh, Mississippi River, the Ohio River runs down through here, Mississippi. That was their main line for their supplies coming up through in the West. So if we could cut off that supply line, we were okay. Finally, we got to Vicksburg to see on July, same time at Gettysburg. We had, and this Anaconda plan that he just talked about a while ago was starting to come to position. Now we had Farragut down in the Gulf. We had the Mississippi River all clogged up. We had Porter over here on the East Coast that uh, uh, stopping supplies from coming in. The only thing we had left was the trains. Now they still had trains running. Now when we got uh, uh, to first point, after we put in uh, Burnside. Burnside took over from McClellan on the second time. And Fredericksburg was a disaster. He just said a while ago. Well now we got Burnside retired or resigned. We brought in Fighting Joe Hooker. Now, we thought Fighting Joe was going to take care of things. Well, Fighting Joe went to Chancellorsville. These same guys went down Joe Hooker. Joe Hooker resigned his position. We brought in George Meade, who went to Gettysburg, and finally came to the victory. I thought he should have pushed the uh, lead back to Virginia's Hooker's River. The rain oh, had just swelled the rivers, and they couldn't get across right away. But George Meade elected not to do that, and he had Lee enough time to get back across the Potomac. So now the war's still going on, and we got to find somebody who, who can do this thing. Now we've been keeping an eye on General Grant in the West, so we decided we're going to make uh, uh, Lieutenant General Grant come back. So February of 1864, I went to the uh, Congress and said, I want to bring back the rank of Lieutenant General. There was only one other guy who's had this rank, and it was George Washington. So we got the rank come back. We sent the telegraph to General Grant on March the 9th, 64. He came to Washington City. We promoted him on March the 10th, General, Lieutenant General. So he takes over the whole thing, and this is the first time during the, the Civil War that the West met East. East and West come together. Because he, he was not one of those guys who would go come to the office or sit in the office and wait for somebody else to do something. He had Sherman who he would rely on. He left him in charge there. And he'd come back to the east to take over this. We had uh, Sheridan who was in the Shenandoah Valley. So when they got off 
settled up. Started from Sherman Cade to Atlanta. Now, 64, there was an election coming up. And I thought I was going to lose this election because we hadn't won any battles. Well, the guy who I was going to run against was McClellan, the guy who I had cards from running the Army. So, Sherman took to Atlanta, September of 1864, got Atlanta. He sent me a telegram, Atlanta is ours. And I did, got re I got reelected. But the war is still going on, we got to figure out what we do. So, he's going to march to the sea, take Joe Johnston, push him all the way to the sea. Now, he's over here in the East Coast. He's got Lee kind of pinned in. We got Jewel Early in the Shenandoah Valley. So he sends Sheridan to make sure that, that Jewel Early doesn't get into fighting. So we've got these spread out. They cannot supply each other with troops. So we've already got them pinned out. They can't do anything. So then uh, the things finally come to, together. We meet with Sherman Porter and General Grant on the River Queen on March 28, 1865. And my instructions to them, because we want to Get these people back in the union. We want to let them up easy. Let them have their guns to shoot crow with, their horses to plow with. We want these people to return our allegiance to the union. That was my instructions when they left that, that folks that, that evening. So Sherman goes back to keep up with Joe Johnson. And he finally pins uh, Bill Lee in at uh, Petersburg and drives him to Appomattox where the surrender takes place. And that's the, the end of the war for me. If I may, uh, here in a moment, uh, the festivities are going to begin, but uh, I'd like to, just, 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 just join us today, uh, I'd like to share a little story that happened in 1862. You see, I received this new jacket, brand new, and it's called the Maryland jacket, and I received a package, and you probably remember this well, a package about this size that contained something addressed to young Jeb Stewart. Well, his little lovely wife was in camp, and so I invited him to my tent to eat. And while we was eating, I was showing him my new jacket. And I said, by the way, uh, Jim Stewart, a young lady by the name of Lee, I believe her first name is Lily, is that not, uh, sent you this package? And I gave it to Jeb. Well, he opens it up. Flora is there, his wife sees it, and these beautiful golden spurs. And she looked at young Jeb and said, uh, young lady from Maryland? <laughs> and uh, he kind of squirmed around and she said, they're quite exquisite. Said, uh, would you mind to see if they fit my boots? <laughs> <laughs> and they put them on the boots and she said, I love them. Thank Miss Lily for the present. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, always had a late way with the lady. You did? <laughs> re remind me when, about the being killed. 50 uh, kisses. Does anybody really quickly have anything else to say? Major Harris, the president yielded his time. Go talk to that man. He's uh, uh, full of uh, knowledge. Uh, and some other people are full of <laughs> knowledge too. Uh, <laughs> oh, I, I didn't, I said knowledge. We want but, to thank you. But, right. but, but we're, we're all out here to educate and try to uh, tell people what happened in, in that, that bad time. We're all good friends. We are our family, as you all We are say. family. When we come down here, it's not a, a reenactment. It's a family reunion. I'll use your thing. It's a family reunion. It is. And, and we, we all know, well, I just met this guy today. I met uh, Long Street a couple months ago. Years so ago. I just met this guy this weekend, but I've not seen you before. And may I introduce real quick? President Davis. Oh, I don't. Not you. Uh, President Davis, the <laughs> real president of the United States. Uh, I'm here. The There's only one president here. That's me. <laughs> uh, really, we're here just for a few minutes. Would you like to say anything, Mr. President, real quick? No, no, no. That's a that's a bad thing. What I'd like know? to say <laughs> is, if I could get a word in, Ed, <laughs> is that the South fought for the Constitution of the United States as it was written by our forefathers. That's what the South fought for, and that's what the South stood for. I'm proud of all my boys <laughs> and what they did and what they stood for. I knew what my boys were doing. They were gentlemen in the war. I cannot say that for the men in blue. There were good men there. But what they did was invaded our homeland. 
and we protected with all that we had until we were totally exhausted. But that's what the South stood for. The South fought for the Constitution of the United States that was written by our forefathers. I'll leave you with that. I won't, I won't take any more of your time. Think about those things. Think about where we are as a nation then and now. We would have already divided over things that were already in the past. We've already accepted more things into our homes that we should ever have allowed. Pray for our nation, pray for our people, that God may hear from heaven and heal our land. We need to repent and turn back to God. As we came back as one nation then, and God has brought us as one nation today, we are one nation under God. God bless America. Thank you, Jim. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you all. Today, ladies and gentlemen, get ready. The Battle of London is about to start. Uh, you're going to have an exciting time. Yesterday, and we all traveled, did we not, all over this country. Yesterday was the best battle I have seen in years by these men. And they said they're going to do it again for you all. So get ready. Get you all.